All right, well, um, first of all, I want to begin by thanking the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and the Prize Committee. I'm very um, honored and humbled to be recognized by my peers in this way. And I just really very much appreciate it. Now, what you're going to be hearing from me today is something a little bit different from what, um, what you've heard so far. I'm not a clinician. I don't do translational research. I'm not a genetic researcher. What I do is I do basic research on the nuts and bolts of how cognition works. But I think of basic research as translational research with a longer time to pay off, but a, but a wider scope. And what I do specifically is I study, I um, record a lot of neural activity from the brains of trained monkeys, monkeys trained to perform cognitive demanding tasks. And we do so with microelectrodes from hundreds of electrodes, both, with, both within a single brain area, you see here, in, in, centered over the prefrontal cortex of the monkey, and also um, across a number of brain areas. So if you look at electrophysiological signatures of network interactions that un underlie cognition. Now, when I started in this field 30 years ago, the state of the art was to record from one electrode at a time, figure out the brain one neuron at a time. But several of us came to realize that you can't figure out the brain just by one piece at a time. It's a, it's a bunch of networks interacting. We have to figure it out on a network level. So we and others developed this technology and this, these techniques for doing these large-scale multiple electrode recordings. And what we do is record the spiking activity of individual neurons and also local field potentials. Think of the spiking activity as an individual voice. In a, in a, in a, it's, a, it's an individual neuron. So it's an individual voice from, from a single neuron. Whereas the LFP, local field potentials, are the mass action of millions of neurons. Think of it as like the roar of a um, crowd at a, at a football stadium. So we'll be looking at both these different levels of, of, um, of processing. Um, and the question I want to ask today is how do we form a thought or an ensemble? Now what an ensemble is, an ensemble is the basic functional unit of the brain. When you have a thought, when you have a memory, when you perceive the color green, or think about what you ate for breakfast this morning, all those things are thought to be represented in the brain by an ensemble, a subset of neurons that are activated that represent that information, that thought, that feeling, that, that, um, that memory. Um, and so the question is, the problem is, you, you, you would think it might be easy to, um, a problem for how ensembles are formed. If the neurons are connected to one another, they form an ensemble. And you activate one member of that ensemble, the entire ensemble gets activated because they're one discrete, isolated functional unit. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. And the problem is, is that neurons don't just participate in one ensemble. Many cortical neurons, this is a discovery we've made back in the early days of electrophysiology, back in the 20th century, it used to be thought that every neuron has one function. And if you figure out what the function of that neuron is, you can figure, and figure out the rest of them, you'll figure out the whole brain, one, one by one neuron at a time. But it's become increasingly clear to us over the past 20 years that many neurons in, in the brain are multitaskers. They have what, what um, my colleague Stefano Fusi called mixed selectivity, that is, an individual neuron doesn't just signal one message, it, it can participate in a variety of functions and participate, send out a variety of messages depending on the context of which other neurons are currently being activated. In other words, the way to think about it is that um, individual neurons participate in many different overlapping ensembles. Now, the reason why this mixed selectivity is important is because they provide computational horsepower to the brain. What they do is these neurons that, have, that are multifunctional provide a high dimensional representational space that allows more possible separations between different types of representations, it allows more complexity, and allows greater capacity. In other words, without these um, multifunction mixed selectivity neurons, you would have a very dumb brain. This has been shown in, in computational simulation. You could throw a million neurons at a, a million units at a computational model of, of, of the brain, and they don't make any difference. The brain can own a simple model with every neuron just doing one job, can only learn a few simple things and it quickly runs out of capacity. What mixed selectivity does is it allows the brain to represent more complicated things and also it essentially becomes capacity unlimited because the, the neurons can participate in many, many different thoughts and functions. So the problem with um, defining, figuring out how the brain forms ensembles, how it forms thoughts, is that we have ensembles um, on top of ensembles on top of ensembles on top of ensembles with individual neurons participating in many different ensembles. Now we know this from studying 
the, um, the prefrontal cortex, which is my main area of interest, we know there's, that the bulk of the neurons there are these mixed selectivity, multifunction neurons. But is that just special about the prefrontal cortex? What about other areas of the cortex? Is it a property of cortex in general? Well, to address this kind of question, Marcus Siegel in my laboratory trained monkeys to categorize the direction of motion or the color of some colored moving dots. The dots could be moving up or down, or they, or they could be red or green. And we simply taught the monkeys on different trials to either tell us what the color, direction of motion is or tell us what the color is. And what Marcus did is a pretty heroic experiment. He recorded from 188 simultaneous electrodes acutely implanted in different cortical areas in, in, in the monkey's brain. The cortical areas um, illustrated here, we have uh, uh, areas in the prefrontal cortex, the frontal eye fields, LIP in the parietal cortex, and then these more traditional visual sensory areas, MT, V4, V4 and IT. And he did these experiments by, by introducing these electrodes by hand, 108 of them, for every single experiment each day. They were heroic, heroically difficult experiments. And what we want to know is the traditional view of cortical function is that the, the cortex is a patchwork of specialized modules. There's a motion area that processes motion. There's a color area processing color. There may be some face areas or even said to be a theory of mind area. So is it true that the cortex is this patchwork of different functional modules? Well, there's many things you look at in this kind of data set because it's such a recording from all these neurons, hundreds of neurons simultaneously. This is one, one of the um, simplest ways I can show you what we found, and what's, what's plotted here is in each of the brain areas we recorded from, shown on the x-axis in each of these uh, um, diagrams, um, there's the brain areas, and on the y-axis is the number of neurons in each area that process information about um, the direction of motion of the dots, the color of the dots, which cue we, we, we had to teach the monkey if it saw one cue and meant pay attention to color, another cue, pay attention to motion, which cue the animal saw, um, or which task the monkey was involved in, or which choice the monkey made. The monkey made a choice by moving its eye. Now what you see here is that, first of all, we have the, the, the um, anterior parts of the brain on, on the left of each graph, and the posterior parts of the brain on the right of each graph. And shown here is grouped here, the bottom up, or so-called sensory information. And here's top down, or information about the, an the animal's behavioral choice, information about the task, the, the knowledge the animal has about what it's, what it's doing. Now what you see here is there's a, there's a somewhat division in the brain in that the back parts of the brain, the more sensory parts of the brain, have more neurons, more information about sensory information, about the cue, about motion, about color. And the front parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex and the uh, um, uh, frontal eye fields and parietal cortex to some extent, has more information about top down, what the animal's task the monkey is doing and what choice it's about to make. But, the bigger picture here is that all these different brain areas all have some information about all aspects of the task. The, in fact, even the traditional V4 is the traditional color area, but it has plenty of information about direction of motion, for example. Now, I don't want to give you the impression, so this suggests that this mixed selectivity, this, multi this multitasking neurons is true across the cortex at large, and not just a special property of, of, a, of the prefrontal cortex. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that, that the whole cortex is all the same, like in sort of a Carl Lashley kind of equipotential um, view of the cortex. These information starts, we can trace the, the flow of this information by looking at neural um, dynamics and neural latency. And we can see that diff different types of information start in different parts of the cortex, but by about 200 milliseconds after, after the information starts, it's all over the cortex. And this, Mixed selectivity, so different cortical areas emphasize different aspects of the task, but task information was widely distributed, intermingled across the cortex. In other words, there was uh, this, and this, this mixing was also on the level of individual neurons, meaning that mixed selectivity is pretty much the rule across the entire cortex. So having said that, this brings us back to this problem. If all these ensembles are overlapping, how do we select one ensemble? Without, if, it, if it was just anatomy, then if you, select, if you activate one ensemble, then the activity will run to a whole bunch of other ensembles, and pretty soon you have a collision of jumbled thoughts in your head. So how does the brain pull one ensemble out? 
Well, one idea, one model we've been working under, um, first articulated by um, Wolf Singer and Pascal Fries more recently, is the idea of communication through coherence. The idea is that neurons that hum together temporarily wire together. Your brain is constantly oscillating anywhere from one time a second to 100 times a second or more. These are the brain waves you hear about. And what the brain waves are is the mass action of millions of neurons all activating and deactivating at the same time. And the idea of communication through, through coherence is that let's say you have two neurons. If they're both synch synchronized, if they're both oscillating at the same frequency and together, then when one neuron is activated and sending these spikes out to another neuron, the other neuron is also in a highly activated state, so it can receive those spikes and process them. <coughs> if they're humming at different frequencies or they're out of phase of one another, but one neuron is activated and the other one's not, and they can't talk to one another. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So the idea is that by having synchronized oscillations in the brain, you could dynamically form networks. You can, you, the neurons that, so in this case here, we have a, two overlapping ensembles, and the pink ensemble neurons are all oscillating together, and the purple ensemble neurons are oscillating together, but oscillating separately from the pink ensemble neurons. So having these neurons go into these synchronized rhythms is a way of putting together an ensemble quickly and on the fly and pulling it out from the underlying anatomy. It also allows cognitive flexibility because anatomy takes a long time to change in your brain. But we all know thoughts come and go very rapidly. They come and go on the fly. We change our mind from, from half second to half second. So there has to be some infrastructure that allows ensemble thoughts to be formed in a very flexible manner. And we think that these patterns of synchronized oscillations is what allows that to be done. It allows <coughs> excuse me, flexibility in the brain. So one experiment we did to, to, the first experiment we did to try to prove this is we trained our monkeys to look at either a vertical bar or a horizontal bar. The bar was vertical or horizontal, or it was red or blue. And we told the monkey, instructed the monkey to pay attention to color or pay attention to orientation. And we recorded from rays of electrodes in the monkey's prefrontal cortex shown here. And what we found is that 50% of randomly selected electrode pairs from these electrode arrays showed rule-specific increases in synchrony between LFPs and also between spikes. In other words, what we found is we found these patterns of synchronized oscillations that seemed to form different ensembles for the two different tasks the monkey was switching back and forth between. And what this shows here is the monkey's prefrontal cortex, the arcuit sulcus, which is right here in the, in the monkey brain, it's here, and here's the principal sulcus right here. And each of these circles is a recording site where we inserted an electrode. And the colored lines indicates pairs of record, recording sites that oscillated together in, in beta band, about 25 hertz. They synchronized their oscillations. And this is for when the monkey was performing the color task, and here's when the monkey was performing the orientation task. Pay attention to color versus pay attention to orientation. And what you see is just what we expected from this ensembles lying on top of ensembles, is that we see a lot of overlap in these two patterns of um, synchronized uh, oscillations. But they're two unique, there's overlap, but there's two unique patterns. The, the, you get two unique patterns of oscillatory resonance in the prefrontal cortex as if these rhythms are forming the two ensembles. Now these, aren't, these weren't just isolated um, pairs of recording sites showing, showing these oscillations. If you look across them all simultaneously, this is a network topology uh, um, representation showing that these networks are highly interconnected um, with one another. It's, it's whole networks oscillating together in a, in a different pattern, which is just what we'd expect if these oscillations are in fact forming um, ensembles. Now, since then, we've been looking for this phenomenon in a variety of different studies, and we're finding it everywhere. So one example here is uh, just recently we found the same rhythm, beta rhythm, about 25 hertz. You see patterns of, of uh, synchronized 25 hertz oscillations forming between the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex, so across brain areas, when the monkey's making decisions about the spatial location of the stimulus. And, um, Another example, we taught monkeys to categorize um, different shapes, either being a cat or being a dog, and we found rhythmic ensembles, much like we, I showed you here, forming for, the, for these, uh, these category decisions. In fact, this paper was just got an email. So this paper is now in press in cerebral cortex. Just got an email this morning. Um, so, if, what, if, you, if you're taking to heart what I'm saying and, and, you say, and you're saying, okay, rhythm, these beta rhythms, these about 25 to 30 hertz rhythms, they 
these patterns of rhythms form ensembles in the brain. One thing you may ask is, well, if that's the case, how is it I can hold two thoughts in mind simultaneously without their rhythms all becoming synchronized with one another and jumbling the thoughts together into a big mess? Well, one idea is that the brain may oscillate these ensembles in and out of phase of one another, like your brain's doing a, ju a juggling act. So there's these patterns of um, synchronized oscillations forming the ensembles, both in about the 25 to 30 hertz range. So to keep your, so your brain, to keep them from smooshing together, your brain does a juggling act. It oscillates them at 25 hertz, but out of phase of one another, so they don't interfere with one another. So we sought to test this, and this is represented here. Here's our um, local field potential oscillating, the roar of the crowd oscillating about 25, 30 hertz, and individual spikes. The idea is they line up on different waves, uh, different parts of this, of this um, local field potential wave for the two different thoughts you're holding in mind. So the way we um, tested this is by training monkeys to remember two pictures and the order in which they appeared. So in this case, the monkey is fixating a small spot of light, staring at the small spot of light. Then we present one picture, which I believe this is an avocado. And then, no, that's a lemon, I think. Um, it's something. It doesn't matter what it is. They're pictures from the internet. We showed the monkey a picture, and then another picture, and then a, then a delay, and then another picture. Then after another delay, three pictures came up simultaneously. And the monkey's job was to look at the two pictures you saw just a couple seconds before, but look at them in the order in which we presented them. So in this case, look at the lemon first and the avocado because you saw the lemon first and the avocado. And what we, the first thing we noticed when we, when, we, when we recorded from our arrays of electrodes in the prefrontal cortex is that we did see these um, beta band, beta low gamma 25 to 30 hertz oscillations happening in the prefrontal cortex as the animal was, was performing this working memory task. So this is shown here. This is the frequency here. So we have these uh, os increased oscillations at around 30 hertz. Um, these periods here where you see the, um, the red colors are the memory um, delays of the task where the monkey's using its working memory. And you can see that the prefrontal cortex oscillates at about 30 hertz whenever the monkey's using its working memory. Well, then what we did is we looked at then the individual spikes, the, the, the individual neurons that are representing one picture or the other picture, picture one versus picture two. And we did an analysis to find out where, where these spikes lined up on these 30 hertz ongoing oscillations. And that's what's shown right here. Here's a, a schematic representation of one of these, uh, one cycle of the oscillation. And what we found when we did this analysis is that spikes from the first object, first picture, lined up earlier in, 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 on the uh, um, wave than spikes from the second object. So this is the polarizing phase of the, of the wave when, when the, when the activity's uh, electrical potential is going down, and that's when neurons become most activated. So the spikes representing the first object lined up very early in the wave, and spikes representing the second object lined up on a later part of the wave. So what that means is that when the monkey, were hold, when the monkey was holding these two pictures in mind at the same time, the, the brain, the prefrontal cortex was oscillating them 30 times a second in and out of phase of one another in, in, this, in this 30 hertz quick juggling act. Now you also notice here is that this isn't just a straightforward juggling, it's more of a syncopated rhythm. All the action is taking place on the polarizing phase of the oscillation, which is when neurons are most activated, and there, there was very little spiking from neurons on the repolarizing phase of the activation. So it was a, syncop it was a syncopated rhythm. The brain was going pause, one, two, pause, one, two. Pause, one, two, pause, one, two, 30 times a second. And what that means is that they don't, this, these oscillations not only keep the ensembles from interfering with one another, but the syncopated rhythm gives an explicit signal message about which object was first and which object was second. Pause, next thing is one, then two, pause, one, then two. Which means that these oscillations not only keep ensembles from thoughts from interfering with one another, it also helps order thought. It helps put thoughts in order. And I'm sure many people in this room know that schizophrenic patients show a decrease in gamma band oscillations. And that gamma, so the idea here is that the decrease in gamma band oscillations will, if they order thought, that would result in disordered thought. So anyway, so the brain was doing this 30 hertz juggling act. And one thing that also occurred to us is this may explain one of the biggest mysteries of cognition. Why is it that your brain could store a whole lifetime of information in your head? You have memories going back decades, and it's all in there somewhere. But for some reason, we only could think about thoughts one or two or three at a time at, at best. 
Well, our hypothesis is that what consciousness, this is consciousness, basically, is that consciousness, consciousness is the lining up, the synchronized rhythms of spikes lining up on, on, on these ongoing uh, um, um, oscillations. And if that's the case, that means that all the information you need for your current contents of consciousness have to fit into one wave, or actually half a wave. And that's a natural limitation that could explain why, why it is that conscious thoughts are so limited in capacity. Now this, um, this, this effort to explain this limited cognitive capacity isn't just an academic interest. It also has a real practical um, um, outcome. Um, cognitive, we, this cognitive capacity varies from person to person. Some people can hold, you test people with like a bunch of colored squares or pictures, much like we did our monkeys. And some people can hold one or two um, squares or pictures in mind simultaneously. Some can hold as many as seven. It varies highly from person to person. Well, individual differences in cognitive capacity can explain as much as 25 or 50% of the difference on tests of intelligence. So here's just one example here. This is a test of fluid intelligence called Raven's Progressive Matrix Matrices. And here's the individual's cognitive capacity. And you can explain 25% of, of the performance on this test of fluid intelligence by knowing what the person's capacity. And if you use a bunch of different intelligence tests so you get a better measure of intelligence, you can explain as much as 50% of, um, of the person's intelligence score by knowing their capacity. I can take you into the laboratory, spend 10, 15 minutes, get, get a notion of your capacity, and get a pretty good stab at what your IQ is. So cognitive capacity is the bandwidth of cognition. And sure enough, here's a measure of um, cognitive capacity. that Your average adult human could hold four of these pictures in mind. It starts out around two when you're young. It reaches its zenith here around, around four when you're about 18 to 45 years old. When you get older, it drop, drops back down to childlike levels. However, we're wiser. We can deal with the loss of capacity more. And that's not a joke. That's actually the truth. Because the greatest form of information compression is knowledge. If you have a word in your mind, you know, you know a concept like peace, love, and understanding? That's one word that means, has a huge amount of meaning to it. And by acquiring this kind of knowledge as we go through life, we can deal with this reduced capacity because we have, we have, we have so much knowledge about how the world works, basically. And also, in virtually every neuropsychiatric disorder, there's a decrease in cognitive capacity. In schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, you name it, they're all associated with a decrease in cognitive capacity. So cognitive capacity is the bandwidth of cognition, and its reduction could explain a lot of different characteristics of neuropsychiatric disorders. So in summary, um, cortical neurons show mixed selectivity. Individual neurons don't have a single function. This is fairly a revolutionary idea, because again, back in the old days of Hubel and Weasel, the idea was that each neuron does one thing, figure out what that neuron does. It turns out not to be the uh, case for, me, for many cortical neurons. This adds computational horsepower to the brain, but raises the question of how ensembles can be formed from overlapping anatomy. Uh, we think, we think the, that way ensembles are formed, particularly for conscious thoughts, is a, a, a patterns of synchronized oscillations reflect the, the information that you're holding, currently holding in the contents of your consciousness. So the way I want you to think about this is anatomy is like a road and highway system. Neuro, it, it, it tells you where the traffic could potentially go. Neural activity, the individual neuron spiking, that's the traffic, but synchronized oscillations are the traffic lights. They direct where traffic actually does go. So the idea is that neurons that hum together temporarily wire together, and this endows cognitive flexibility. Multiple ensembles are simultaneously held in working memory, in consciousness, by oscillating them in and out of phase of one another. And this may explain the limited capacity for simultaneous thought, the, the bandwidth of, of cognition. And finally, I'll leave you with the thought that there's converging evidence from people like Wolfsinger um, that, that abnor abnormalities and synchronized oscillation, oscillations may have a central role in the pathology of diseases like schizophrenia, autism, and Parkinson's disease. Thank you very much. <laughs> You know, John, you didn't make me feel very good when you sure. showed that slide, what happens to people over 65. But you're wise, though. <laughs> you're, a, you're a wise man. But I can't, I have no capacity left. But you deal with the capacity better because you're so wise. Oh, jeez, this guy. I'm not making that up. A that's, that's a real thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I, actually, if you would send my mother an email explaining that to her, she'd uh, okay, send me your address. <laughs> so, yes, uh, yes, sir. Can you? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
We haven't looked into it, but it must. Repeat because, the question. Oh, if he, if he did, does synaptic pruning have any effect on these, these oscillatory patterns? They must because neurons can't oscillate unless they're connected together somehow. So again, the, that's the highway system. Traffic can only go where the roads are. So if you do anything that's going to affect synaptic connectivity, anything that affects connectivity to neurons, you're going to, you're going to um, greatly affect these oscillations. And the thing about these oscillations, the resonance, patterns of um, resonance, is that they're very stable when they're together, but it only takes a little tweak to get them to out of phase of one another. So a little change can make a huge difference. Hi. Um, multitasking, uh, multitasking can lead to mental retardation, loss of uh, memory. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you say that again, please? Multitasking. Multitasking, yes. Can uh, lead to premature aging? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> but... <laughs> I wish I could say yes, because multitasking is a really, really bad idea. You think you can multitask, you can't. No one can multitask. What you do when you multitask is you're task switching. You're switching very rapidly between the two tasks. And when you do that, your brain's got to figure out where it left off when it switches back to another task, and it also makes, makes mistakes. Your brain deludes itself into thinking it can multitask because your brain craves information. We, we, our brains evolved in an environment where there was very little information. And a rustling in the bushes might mean a tiger is about to leap out. So it was, it was adapted for your brain to crave information. And also because of this limited information environment we evolved in, we developed this capacity or we developed this limited capacity because a lar larger capacity wasn't needed. But now take those two things, bring it to our modern world when there's so much stuff going on, we have a brain that craves multitasking but just can't do it well. So don't try, and especially, and I really, really mean this, put away your cell phone when you drive. Even having a conversation on the phone with a headless, um, hands-free um, um, device will cause you to miss as much as 50% of the things on the road in front of you. Studies have shown this. I, I love you all. I want you all to have very safe lives. So put away your cell phone when you drive. Are there, um, excuse me, can you say uh, over here, other so side? Here. Oh, yes. There. Over here. Yeah, so if, if multitasking is, is, um, and trying to be efficient is not good, are there ways to um, enhance uh, cognitive capacity in, in people for, through different age spans and people that may have compromised ability, say through technology, through software, through drill, problem solving, are there exercises like that that can be um, uh, effective intervention? Mm -hmm. I wish I could say yes, but you know these brain games you're hearing about? They don't really work. What you do is you get much better at playing the game, but there's almost no translation in, into, into real world cognition. Yeah. Um, and people have tried to increase cognitive capacity for this very reason, because it really is the bandwidth of cognition. And there's, you can increase it a little bit, usually in the context of a task, but there's no real world benefit. What we're working on is working on ways in which you can play with these waves and maybe increase capacity. We want, of course, to try to do this with non-invasive brain stimulation, like TACS, where you put electrodes on your scalp. And maybe we could take that wave and stretch it out a little bit in time, slow it down, or increase its amplitude. If we increase space on the wave, maybe we could, maybe we could hang a couple extra thoughts in there, and we could increase capacity. This is something we're working on right now. So, so these online things about uh, in, increasing your capacity and your ability to think and keeping people going better, that they just don't work. They don't work. You know, <laughs> I mean, wow. they, they, you'll get better playing those games, but it won't have any real world, real world benefit. Sorry. Well, on that note. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Miller. <laughs>